I'd like to introduce Debbie Moran. So most of you know Debbie, and she really needs no introduction here. She's been a longtime member of HAS and has really had a lifelong interest in astronomy since uh, her childhood growing up in Midland, Texas, where I, I read, Debbie, that the only thing to see really there is the night sky. <laughs> yeah, uh, you've been a, a member of the HAS for a long time. You've served in a lot of capacities, uh, currently serving as, as novice chair in charge of uh, the programs that we have for new members. Uh, she also participates in outreach quite a bit and gives lots of talks to retirement centers, uh, se senior centers, and, and other places as well, and uh, volunteers your time as a telescope operator at George Observatory in Brazos Bend State Park. Uh, you are the 2017 recipient of the International Dark Sky Association's Hogue Robinson Award for Education of Government Officials about Outdoor Lighting Issues. Uh, did I get that correct? That's correct. I'm okay. the only failed recipient. So. <laughs> We're I'm hoping that changes soon. Yes, absolutely. Um, and in, tw in 2010, your Woodside neighborhood became the first one within the Houston city limits allowed to install low glare, fully shielded decorative street lights. And for the past four years, she's presented concerns about the choice of high glare white LED street lights to Houston city officials in hopes that the Houston area will someday join other communities in moving towards warm or soft white to amber LEDs, which are recommended by the American Medical Association for the reduced glare and reduced re disruption of day-night circadian function. Uh, she's also lobbied for a lighting ordinance or education programs to reduce security light glare and created the website www.softlighthouston.com to educate citizens on lighting issues. Uh, the site recently prompted the Houston Police Department uh, to recommend soft shielded lighting. And uh, in addition to all of that, Debbie spent 27 years as a violinist in the Houston Symphony. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Debbie. Thank you very much, Joe. Oh, I'm sorry, before we start, Debbie, I was just gonna mention to folks, if you have questions as uh, the presentation moves along, if you would like, and I'll stop sharing here, uh, there's a chat function within Zoom. So click on the chat function itself and ask your questions within the chat function. And uh, we'll get to those uh, throughout the presentation, uh, likely holding most of them off until the very end. But uh, if there's something that's pertinent to the conversation, we'll go ahead and ask those uh, when we get to a good break within the presentation itself. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, let me make sure I can be heard because I can't see any of my uh, controls right now. We can hear you fine, Debbie. Okay, great. So the title of this talk is Light Right to Bring Back the Night, Not Dark Sky Issues, because the point is that humans are not cats, we're not owls, we do need some light. The question is not about whether to light, it's about how to light. And um, this is a particular threat in the age of LED lighting. LED lighting is highly directional, so it could be a solution to our problem with night sky lighting, but that same directionality can also create an enormous amount of glare if it's used incorrectly. Um, again, our website is softlighthouston.com, which is designed specifically for the, the general public. I found many sites which are really speaking to the advocate. We needed a simple, easy to use site which shows good quality lighting in action. And you can see that on the gallery page and get and understand the whys and wherefores and also how to find good quality lighting is on the education page at softlighthouston.com. So the reason I know anything about this, I'm a violinist, not a lighting engineer, is that I am an amateur astronomer who's been to many conferences and since almost its founding, the International Dark Sky Association has been educating us about lighting. It was founded in 1988 by doctors David Crawford and Tim Hunter, who lived in Tucson, and their, initial, their immediate concern was the lighting of Tucson and its effect on nearby Kitt Peak National Observatory. Uh, cities used to not light quite in such volume as we do now, and they realized that something was going to be, need to be done, or we we're going to lose the night sky, not only in cities, but outside of cities in the more rural areas. So they have a very simple premise, which is to point lighting down and to hide the source of the light. And if you do that, the resulting light, which is what's actually important, that's the light actually hitting your house or your sidewalk or your street, can be better seen using less light and less glare. They, their website is darksky.org. They also coined the term light pollution. Now the question is, a lot of people scoff when they hear the idea of light as a pollutant, 
But to understand that term, let's look at the dictionary definition, which is contamination of air, water, or soil by substances that are harmful to living organisms. So first of all, if you look at the picture on the page, um, on the left side you can see a sky more like our ancients would have seen. That's a photograph, it's a few more stars than you can see with your naked eye. But the ancients would have seen an incredibly black sky with thousands of stars. That now that we have started to really ramp up lighting in cities and much of it is pointed upward, the murky sky on the right is what we see. That resembles the way air pollution affects the air or the way water pollution pollutes streams and, and rivers. Now the other consideration with pollution, it's often considered a pollutant if it affects health adversely and light pollution definitely affects our human health as well as animals and plants. And the way it does that is it disrupts the natural daylight cycle in humans, which is signaled to us by the hormone melatonin. So what happens is that the blue light, which I will go into more in the future in this talk, suppresses this, mel this melatonin, and that is what signals us to feel sleepy at night and go to sleep, and its disappearance is what wakes us up. Um, the result of this is that our sleep quality may be poorer, meaning on average it might be a little bit shorter in length. It may be more interrupted. This results in daytime sleepiness, which is practically epidemic in the United States. Every week I can read an article about sleep problems or hear a sleep doctor on the radio. Um, when you're tired during the day, one tends to eat more carbohydrates. This can lead to illnesses such as obesity, diabetes, poor cardiovascular health, and even depression. And there are certain cancers that grow faster when melatonin is suppressed at night. Those are the hormone-based cancers. I will go into that in more detail a little bit later. So the easy solution, a quick and easy one, is just turn off the lights. And this would be a very short talk if that were the end of it. Actually, as it turns out, we do need light to see at night. We have a 24-7 society, and we are not good at seeing in the dark. Human eyes are terrible at seeing in the dark. The question is, is how do we use that lighting? Um, if you get nothing else out of that, this talk, the premise is that we would prefer that people choose a warmer color of light, and you can do that with LED lighting, that it be shielded. That means that the, what's creating the light, either LEDs or a light bulb, is underneath a shield so that when you stand to the side of the light, you don't actually see the bulb. And it should be directed toward the area that you need lighting. So here's a little village in England, and this out here is not a road, it's, it's the beach. So when they revise their lighting, it actually looks quite a bit crisper near the buildings. The road runs along the buildings, is very well lit. But these people can now walk out to the beach for a romantic night walk, still see stars in the sky, and not disturb the life that's out in the water and on the beach, which needs that nighttime to function well. So before I talk about LEDs, I'd like to talk about the previous sources of lighting so we can see what's changed in our lighting sources. Um, about 40, 50 years ago, mercury vapor was the primary source of street lighting. Around 40 years ago, high pressure sodium came on as a solution to using lower energy at the time. And that's what we had most recently in Houston. And this is a drop lens. Um, design, which means that you do see the light source. That's one of the reasons that our lighting before appeared a little muddy. It's not just the color, it's that we saw the glare of the light bulb. And a metal halide is a similar technology, but it was a wider color. And we've had a little bit of that in Houston also. So now we have the new kid on the block. What is LED? Behold, the light emitting diode or LED. But where did it come from? Meet Nick Hollywood, Jr., born in Illinois in 1928. Although Nick was born in the U.S., his parents had immigrated from the Carpathian Mountains of Europe. During Nick's childhood, his father traveled widely, working primarily as a mining engineer. Nick was the first member of his family to receive formal schooling. Eventually, Nick earned a Ph.D. in electrical engineering from the University of Illinois. During this time, he worked with Dr. John Bardeen, who later co-invented the transistor. Over the course of his career, Nick has made numerous discoveries, improvements, and breakthroughs, but he's best known for one outshine the rest, the light-emitting diode, or LED. But what is it exactly? First, let's start with the diode. Diodes are 
or simple semiconductor, and the conductor material is usually aluminum, gallium, and arsenic. The flow of electrons in this material can produce light more efficiently than a traditional incandescent bulb. LEDs last much longer than light bulbs, and they produce much less heat. For this achievement, Nick is sometimes known as the father of the light emitting diet. As subsequent researchers revised his invention, the LED has spread out from labs at General Electric to country, cities, and homes throughout the country. So, what are the characteristics of LED light, which are different from previous light sources? Well, the most important one is that it's a point source. It can be, and it's highly directional. It's sort of like concentrated light, not quite as strong as a laser, but that idea. So if you are looking at an LED light directly, it can be incredibly bright, and if you look at it from the side, it would be less so. Um, it's commonly made in white colors. That's easy. In fact, that was the most efficient color for many years. That has changed now. And so a lot of the LED lights made for security and street lighting have a high blue spectral content. For us, that's a problem. But it's also available in many different colors. It's not necessary to choose that particular color. Um, one of the reasons it's chosen, I will go into later, it has to do with um, the short wavelength, but that has advantages, but it also has disadvantages when being used at night. It's also instant on and dimmable. This is a great advantage for street lighting. In Los Angeles, they can control all of the street lights with a single laptop. It's extremely efficient in converting energy to light instead of heat. That's why it can use an eighth of the wattage to, get, to generate the same amount of light because you can practically touch an LED light bulb that's been on for hours because all of that energy is going to light instead of heat. And also they have extreme longevity compa compared to previous sources. So that's a great advantage to cities. What we want does not eliminate those advantages, it doubles down on them. That's the important message here. So one of the problems that can develop or unintended consequences is that LED lighting is so inexpensive compared to previous lighting um, that people can use it indiscriminately. So um, what they do, it doesn't help to have lighting which is one sixth the wattage for the same amount of light if you use six times as much light. This light, as you can see, a lot of it is hitting our eyes as we are across the street. And this is not even the highest glare direction. Actually, these lights are tilted to the right. And for the people coming on Beech Nut facing this light at the stop sign, it's an incredibly high glare. All of that light that we can see from across the street has nothing to do with lighting the parking lot. It's wasted. They could turn all of this lighting down the parking lot lighting would be so bright they could also take out quite a few of those fixtures. Um, so we are asking that people use light efficiently, not not use light. I got interested in this because I heard a talk by, I believe it was by Tim Hunter, several years before cities started to adopt LED street lighting. And I remember he said at the time that the International Dark Sky Association was concerned that cities would adopt LED technology because of its great advantages but before the warmer color technology was really well developed. The early LEDs, it was cheaper to make the white ones. They produce more light per watt. And that's exactly what happened. In 2014, I was told by the Office of Sustainability when I was trying to make our decorative lights become more common in Houston, that I would be very pleased. We were adopting LED street lighting. They would all be pointed downward. But they told me that the color was a color called 4000K, which is a neutral white. It's not the bluest white, but it has a high blue component. I immediately became alarmed and wrote my first letter in mid-2014, actually before it was announced in the Houston Chronicle. So the question is, is, is brighter better? This seems intuitive to most people. I was trying to figure out how to explain this, and then I realized that one of my favorite Hitchcock movies has the answer. I need to warn those of you who have not seen the movie Rear Window, that this is the pivotal scene, but it definitely makes our case. Your friend, the girl, could have turned me in. Why didn't she? What is it you want? A lot of money? I don't have any money. Say something. Say something. Tell me what you want. Can you get me that ring back? No. Tell her to bring it back. 
I can't. The police have it on now. So as you can see, that only works up to a point, but now you understand why police carry those incredibly bright white flashlights. If you want to know what happens, you'll have to watch the movie. So light pollution, LEDs can be either the problem or the solution. These are actual hotel window views uh, at places I stayed. I took these with my cell phone. On the left is the Dallas Doubletree near Love Field. I was in the seventh floor. And I had two of these very high glare white LEDs pointed up toward my window. I believe they were just trying to advertise the building. But it was extremely difficult to sleep. The room did have blackout shades, but when I closed them, the white light leaked around the edges. And as you become dark adaptive when you're falling asleep, it's amazing how much your room feels flooded with white light if you have something that high intensity outside your window. Conversely, in downtown Geneva, I was staying at the Hotel Suisse. It's directly across from the middle of downtown, the train station. And the third night, I'd been sleeping very, very well. I opened the drapes just to look outside, and I noticed what I had not seen before, which was a warmly lit, warm white, softly lit town plaza. There were a couple of people enjoying the night. Um, I had always already in my robe, but I decided to go downstairs and see what the light source was. So this is that plaza from the ground. And if you look above the lighting, you'll notice it's all pointed downward, but all these windows up here are, it's nighttime up there. There's no problem, there's no light directed at those windows. So it was very easy to close the blackout shades and really have a completely dark room. This is the concept that we're asking for is to simply keep light on the ground and avoid having it go up into the sky. The other question is, how much light do you really need? So often cities will overlight. We don't have to be surgeons at night. We don't have to read novels by night. We just need to be able to check our surroundings, make sure there's not an intruder, be able to see one from some distance, and find our car, and re maybe recognize colors. So the police want that. But we can do all of that with a sensible LED light. The other thing is there's a physiology of the eye to consider. So if you dim a light 50%, it actually appears 70% as bright instead of only 50% because as the glare is reduced, the eye can see the resultant light hitting the parking lot better. Notice that even at 20%, this light still looks like plenty of light, especially if you block out the other two pictures. You would think there's nothing wrong with that parking lot. Now, at this time, 80% of the world's population cannot see the Milky Way from their home. And we don't expect to see the Milky Way in a really large city, although that was once possible. Bill Spitzeri from Chicago has said that he could see the Milky Way growing up on the south side of Chicago. Unfortunately, especially with LED lighting, which is getting wider and brighter, this is becoming even worse. The light pollution is getting about 2% worse each year. And that's something we could reverse with better choices. So at night, brighter is not better for the eye, and why is that? Well, the human eye has an astonishing dynamic range of about one to one billion, or 20 camera stops. We can both see an incredibly bright, sunny day, and after about 30 minutes of dark adaptation, we can see a, a dark sky filled with stars. The problem is, is we can't see all of that at once. So at any one time, we only have about a 1 to 1,000 ratio of from the brightest to the darkest thing we can see. So what happens is if we have a very bright light source in the scene, everything darker than a certain threshold turns black. That's true even if there's light on it. In fact, you can test this yourself, as I'll show you in the next slide, by holding up your hand to block the light. Um, we have the same problem with headlights, as the headlights have gotten bluer and brighter it's becoming more and more difficult to see around cars that are coming at you. Now, this is not a matter of 
your pupil ex, um, being shrunk down to the smallest, which, it it, which does happen also, and then needing to wait 30 minutes for it to open up. This is an instantaneous effect. So in this picture, which is a stock photo from the International Dark, Asso Dark Sky Association, this man is standing at the gate in both photos. Only when a hand is held up to block this light source can he be seen. Now the problem with uh, making this case to people is they don't notice what they can't see. They only notice what they can. So someone who isn't informed about this subject might look at this light and say, gee, this is great. I see the whole backyard. No problem. Only when you show them that this light is preventing you from seeing beyond it do they then understand. And then they start to notice as they look around their community that that makes all the difference in the world. So glare is actually the enemy of the night. It, it, it diminishes human vision at night. And what creates glare? Well, it's a factor of brightness, color, and light scatter. It's, a, it's actually physics. So blue light is a shorter wavelength than red light, redder light. And because of that short wavelength, it scatters worse in the atmosphere and in your eye. In fact, blue light scatters 10 times worse than red light. And this is why even well-designed street lights that point straight down, if they're bright, they will still scatter upward. Uh, they will actually escape upward um, from the light fixture, even the light fixture is trying to direct it downward. The reflected light, if it's too bright, can also scatter much worse than a little bit warmer light. This is, if your kid asks you why is the sky blue, it's the same principle. All of the light from the sun is scattered, but the blue light is scattered the most, and that creates that blue color when we look up at the sky. The, uh, the problem with arguing this case is that that same short wavelength is also what makes things look especially crisp, especially in the daytime. Those, it shrinks your pupil to the smallest slit. That increases sharpness. And this needs to also be understood by advocates. The problem is, is there's also all the disadvantages at night, and therefore we need to split the difference when we're choosing lighting at night. At this point, I want to talk about how light color is described. If you're buying light bulbs, you will see these same terms used. There's a measurement called correlated color temperature, or CCT for short. And it's confusing because the color is described using thousands of degrees in temperature of Kelvin. And it has nothing to do with the heat when you feel the light bulb. It has to do with what color a piece of iron would glow if heated to that, that temperature. So lower numbers actually mean a warmer or yellower light, and higher numbers mean a, a bluer light. That would be a hotter piece of metal glowing bluer and hotter. For, to, to give you benchmarks that might be uh, more familiar, 2200K is the familiar amber color of our previous high-pressure sodium street lighting. 2700K are the light bulbs that are labeled soft white, and were the most commonly used when we had incandescent bulbs before LED bulbs became common. 4000K is very close to the color of the cool white fluorescent tubes that we used to have. It's considered a cool white. 5000K are the light bulbs labeled daylight, and then you can get into even cooler, uh, cooler whites. How does this affect glare? Well, in this photo, all four of these lights are actually the same wattage, but notice that the, the more blue there is in the light bulb, the harsher it is to look at to the eye. When we were advocating about the street lights, which are 4,000K, it's very difficult to convince people that this is gonna be a problem when they only see one or two on their street. They can't quite imagine yet multiplying that problem by 179,000 street lights and many square miles of, square miles of, um, of Houston's expanse to drive through. So this is why cities are now choosing these uh, warmer colors, um, especially you can use these on the major streets. In the residential areas, you want to go as warm as you can afford. Um, you want the least blue possible where people are sleeping. But if you must have a wider light on a major street, 2700K is becoming very, very popular. This is as blue as Pittsburgh is going to go, and they are now also testing amber lights. Uh, Phoenix has only 2,700K right now, and Los Angeles has already abandoned the 4,000K and is using 3,000K and on the major streets and even warmer on other streets. So just to show you this difference, this was the first picture I could find anywhere on the entire internet. 
of a what was then a warm white LED streetlight installation before and after. On the left, you can see white metal halide. Notice, for instance, also this is very important that the poles did not change. So they didn't put poles closer together to make the light spread more even. And notice that, ironically, in this picture on the left, they are actually trying to spread the light farther. We do see the sides of those white light bulbs, yet the way our eye reacts to it is similar to the way the camera reacts to it. We have what we call the zebra stripe effect. So yes, the light is very, excuse me, my cat's coming. Um, she was ill, so I need to put her in my lap. The light was very, very um, clear directly underneath, but the way, but anything darker in between looks especially dark because of that glare hitting our eyes. As soon as we get rid of the glare, notice that these lights are not actually trying to spread the light as far. The whole street looks more even. So to see the difference, um, Jim King, a member of our club, had the great idea of filming a pedestrian walking from left to right. Notice that in this school, which is Houston School, there's warm shielded lighting here. And then there's a, high, a single high glare security light, the second one is actually a reflection of that light. And then she goes into a more shielded area of white light over here. And notice how she changes as she walks from left to right. So it's only 19 seconds, start focusing here on the left. Okay. It says recording, I guess. That is a huge difference in visibility and level. So what happened here was there was a, a phenomenon that has a name. It's called veiling luminance. When she passed in front of the white security light where we're looking directly at it, there was a hazy effect. She became very ghostly and very inconspicuous. And newer lighting calculation methods take that into account and calculate for it. In fact, the thinking has changed. It used to be you want to create a little glare in order to spread the light farther. Now, the newest Illuminating Engineering Society guidelines for lighting say it's actually better when you're mixing cars with pedestrians if you have to minimize the glare and be a little bit less uniform. They would rather have the pedestrian, um, instead of always looking what they call positively lit, where you can see what color they're wearing and you actually see the light on them, what was most important is the contrast. It's okay for the pedestrian to either be a dark silhouette against a bright background or lit where you can see her. The worst possible situation is where the glare that's hitting your eyes completely prevents you from seeing the pedestrian. And that is now in the new guidelines. So the other problem with uh, poorly designed lighting is health and the environment. What happened is that our bodies our bodies evolved in a situation where light naturally reddens at night. Often cities would say if we use white street lights and white uh, uh, business lights, that's a more natural light. That light is only natural to humans and animals during the daytime. It only occurs in nature during the daytime. So the mechanism for us sensing nighttime when it's time to sleep is the disappearance of that blue light from the, from the environment. We only had reddened sunsets, and for millennia, we only had firelight and flame to, uh, to see by at night. And that's what, we're, what we are evolved for. So what happens is that as the sun sets, the blue light component disappears. Not necessarily all light, we might have firelight, but that disappearance of the blue light signals our bodies to create the hormone melatonin, which peaks in the middle of the night. That is what signals us to feel sleepy. In the morning, the melatonin subsides as the sun starts to come back into our windows and cortisol rises and, pre and causes us to feel alert. So what, there's also a curve at which melatonin is most suppressed. And as you can see, it peaks in the bluer part of the spectrum. The problem with LED lighting that's too white, whether it is a security light in your bedroom window or a street light, is that it has a lot of that same part of the blue spectrum in it, which suppresses that melatonin. So cities have claimed that 4,000 K light was okay because it's the same Kelvin rating as moonlight. The problem is, is that the spectral content is not the same. 
Moonlight is a situation where you're taking a very bluish white sunlight and reflecting it off of a warm surface. And what is reflected back to us here on Earth is actually has quite a bit of the blue taken out of it. LED light is created by mixing colors and a typical 4000K street light has a strong blue spike in it to create that white color. And um, that's a lot of the problem. That is about 30% blue. This is five times as much blue as our previous street lighting had. The other thing with comparing it to the moonlight is the moon is between 30 times fainter if it's full and thousands of times fainter than a white LED street light, depending on the phase of the moon. We do not have that brightness outside our windows every night full time. So the health problems again are the poor sleep, we mentioned this before, diabetes, weight gain, uh, depression, and significant in incidence of certain hormone-based cancers. And these are some of the most common ones. These include breast, prostate, and colorectal cancers. So how do we know that? Well, in the 1980s, Dr. Richard Stevens, who we just lost this past August, wondered why there was a sudden uptick of breast cancer rates and mostly in the developed world, not so much in the undeveloped world. And he realized that they correlated a lot to the increase of light in the city. He couldn't account for it with some kind of major change in exercise rate or diet, but he knows that light was changing. And it did occur to him that this melatonin suppression might be part of the problem. Since he postulated that, thousands of studies have corroborated that hypothesis and not, um, not shot it down. In fact, it's gotten to the point where the American Cancer Society considers blue light at night an official carcinogen. One of the most famous studies is of over 40,000 nurses over many years, and they found twice the incidence of breast cancer and the nurses mostly working night shifts versus the day shift nurses. Conversely, a Haifa st Israel study found that blind women living in cities had unusual unusually high melatonin levels in their blood, and only about half the normal breast cancer rate as sighted women. And this is only true if they were completely blind. It did not work out if they were legally blind and could still get, see light. Also, cancer tumors have been grown in the lab. I heard a talk by Dussel, Dr. Russell Reiter from Austin, um, who does this kind of uh, research for melatonin and cancer, and he showed us curves where these cancer tumors grew much faster when melatonin was absent and melatonin had a suppressing effect. They grew, but they grew much slower. Melatonin is also an antioxidant, so it can also um, prevent the formation of cancer in the first place. The drug tamoxifen, commonly used to treat breast cancer, lost its efficacy even in dim light coming into a bedroom, so much so that doctors started to prescribe melatonin along with them the tamoxifen. And if you do a search for MD Anderson and melatonin studies, you will find for many cancers, there are studies where they're adding melatonin to the cancer drug. And then finally, most recently in 2018, uh, we took satellite photos of Barcelona, Madrid from those, uh, not satellite photos, they were from the International Space Station. And this, the International Space Station is is able to see not only the amount of light, but also the color of the light, better than satellites can. These are early adopters of white LED street lights, but there was still some warmer lit neighborhoods. Um, so they interviewed 4,000 residents. They asked them, they gave them questionnaires for indoor light exposure, so that could be factored out. And they found twice the prostate cancer rate and one and a half times the breast cancer rate and the people had the highest blue light exposure compared to the warmly lit neighborhoods. And not only that, it was an exact sliding scale. The worse the blue light exposure, the higher the, the cancer rate. They have also recently published on their results on colorectal cancer. One of the doctors told me they were finding 90% higher colorectal cancer rates in the, in the white lit neighborhoods. Fortunately, there is a fix if you're stuck with this. You, uh, blackout shades can mitigate this, this health risk. But from a crime standpoint, putting really thick shades up also minimizes neighborhood awareness. This is Dr. Mario Mata. Um, to June 2016, the American Medical Association came out with an official paper recommending that cities use streetlights no bluer than 3000 K, preferably less so, both for the glare aspect, for seeing well at night, and also for these health aspects. 
It was widely publicized. I brought this into city council, but what the problem was is that the Illuminating Engineering Society and some industry magazines fought against this, uh, this report saying that doctors don't know anything about lighting. They should listen to the lighting engine, not the lighting engineers. They agreed with the American Medical Association, but the lighting vendors were not too happy. And there was a lot of pushback. And I know that that had, uh, was a, a big factor in what I was dealing with with trying to explain this to the city. So what about everyone else besides human beings that are also affected by artificial light at night? In this tree, you see that only the leaves on the side of the, of the light there did not drop. Trees decide when to drop their leaves based on the relative length of day and night. So as the days get shorter, they are signaled to drop their leaves. Um, the street light was interfering with that relative length. So that side of the tree had no idea summer was ending. These are, this is a soybean field. Soybeans turn brown just before they go to seed, but notice there's a narrow strip of green over here. They are not uh, doing their life cycle correctly. If you look carefully, there's street lights all the way up and down. A study out of Switzerland found that nighttime pollination was dramatically reduced with, under, under strong lighting. So people went out and actually counted uh, the pollinations that, that they could see, and they found 62% fewer visits in a well-lit field versus a darker field. Sea turtles are strongly affected by artificial light. When the turtles hatch, they, it is imperative that they find their way back to the ocean as fast as they can before predators get to them or before they die. And they have evolved to find the ocean by either sun or starlight or moonlight reflecting off the waves. When they are born on beaches with artificial human light, they often go the wrong way and die. These are the trails of sea turtles which have gotten lost because of artificial light. There is a fix for that. There are turtle safe lights now. We need these in Galveston and Freeport, which have two different colors and they can use the more reddish amber color during turtle hatching season and then go to a warmer color. Um, I actually don't think there's anything wrong with this for humans, but this solves the problem for turtles hatching. Fireflies have diminished greatly since I was a child. That's partly due to pesticides, but also largely due to the increase in artificial light. They use these light signals for the male to find the female, and so their mating has been, large, has been disrupted greatly. In fact, my uncle, um, we were just in conversation, he had no idea I was giving a talk like this, and he said, you know what, I really miss fireflies. Well, this is why. Uh, migratory birds are, have a major problem with artificial lighting, especially lights from windows and skyscrapers. Uh, and uh, this cartoon says, what's the solution? I hope it's not that all the birds on the wire have to wear sunglasses. So last year, this news story aired in Houston because Houston is the second worst city. Houston, Chicago, and Dallas are on the migratory bird route. And we are starting with this. 600 million birds will smack into a building this year. And a new study by Cornell University shows Houston is the second most dangerous for migrating birds. But as Josh Marshall shows us, one simple step can make our city safer for those flocks. This study is opening a lot of eyes to this topic, but perhaps the most attention this has ever gotten locally happened in Galveston. Three 198 birds crashed into a Galveston high rise in 2017. All but three of the warblers died. It's always devastating. After the Galveston tragedy, Dr. Richard Gibbons and the Houston Audubon Society took action. They partnered with American National in Galveston and made changes to the building to prevent another accident. They turned their lights off uh, and it became a conservation victory, a business that truly led and wanted to be Part of the solution. Now, in the face of being labeled the second most dangerous city for migratory birds, Houston Audubon is calling on the city of Houston to become part of the same solution. We can take action to reduce that risk, so we ask people to take a flash. Bird conservationists want homeowners and businesses in high rise buildings to turn off unnecessary lights from at least April 19th to May 7th. That's when 50% of this year's migratory birds will pass through Houston. That's what we've asked people if they will, if they will help us take a pledge and make Houston, the Houston area a safer place for the migratory birds. Getting involved in taking that pledge doesn't require a lot of work, neither does turning off the lights. To find out how, just go to hou.com. 
in Houston. Josh Marshall, KHOU, 11 News. And we are starting with this, 600. So right now we are in migratory bird season. Another thing that affects Houstonians is a recent study out of Chicago found that West Nile virus stays infectious in birds 41% longer if they are exposed to artificial light versus natural darkness at night. I don't know if there's anything we can do about that. I don't think we're going to get rid of all light in cities, but it's possible that subdued light pointed downward would minimize this effect. There's also bat-friendly lighting. This is in the Netherlands, and England's doing something similar. Some areas that are close to bat areas are using red light instead of uh, warm white to allow to not disrupt their feeding patterns. I've seen the bats under the Wall Street Bridge. We have a million bats right here in the middle of Houston. So the number one reason to avoid white light at night, I found if no other argument will work, the yuck factor might. <laughs> So after seeing quite a few of these grasshopper videos, I wondered if anyone on YouTube had managed to catch a white light next to an amber light. And sure enough, I found that and I took a screenshot this is from an amateur video on YouTube. Notice they are completely ignoring the old amber light and they're all hovering around the white LED light. That's because they actually can't sense the amber light very much. That's why bug lights are yellow. So it takes at least two years of advocacy in most cities to get a change. Houston has been very difficult. Um, and one of the reasons is that when a city is told that they will have to go up in wattage to use warm light, you actually have the more progressive members of the city council fighting you because they want the maximum energy reduction both for money and also for climate change. Um, and we will discuss that a little bit later about why that argument was made and how that argument has changed. Um, Houston also makes its money um, supplying energy that might have been a little bit extra hurdle here in Houston, or it might have just been older thinking about how to calculate lighting. But all of these cities started out with the same white light we had and eventually moved away from it. It doesn't mean they pulled thousands of lights, but it means that as they got new information, they started choosing different lighting. So the other problem is in the press. This happens in every city. The lights are announced, the complaint article comes out, but every time the guy who likes the lighting gets the last word. What you don't see in these stories is that there's lighting that's better than both the old lighting and the new lighting. 
You may wear sunglasses when it's sunny, but tonight some residents in the North Bay community have resorted to wearing them to block out what they say are overly bright new street lights. Yeah, they catch your attention. ABC 7 News reporter Kate Larson has the story now from San Rafael. You can see how it just blinded me in my eyes. Elise Leyland says this street light took her by surprise when one night last month it lit up her little street on an otherwise dark San Rafael hilltop. I was really upset. I was upset because I love the night. Elise and about a hundred other San Rafael residents have complained to the city about how bright and white the new LEDs are compared to the dimmer yellow light cast by the old high pressure sodium streetlights. The neighbors are um, noticing the difference in them. Bill Guerin is the director of public works in San Rafael. He says the city took out an $800,000 loan to pay for the 2,700 new LED streetlights. So far, 2,400 have been installed. Garen says wherever neighbors have complained about the LEDs, the city may install dimmers or light shields. If uh, a light is shining uh, back from the street light to someone's house, putting a shield behind the light will block that light from going to the residence. While Elise is protecting her eyes at night with sunglasses, her neighbor says he likes the new look. I think they're safe. I think this, is, this neighborhood is far too dark. We've had trouble with robberies, break-ins, break-ins into the mailboxes. Um, they're not that significantly more bright than the old guys. The LED lights are expected to save $175,000 in yearly electrical costs. In San Rafael, Kate Larson, ABC7 News. You may wear sunglasses. Sorry. So, the qu oh yes, and also Galveston last year, the the typical article came out with a person who hates the lighting, and especially devastating in a place that has the beach and sea turtles. This um, Houston's continuing to put in this kind of lighting. This was um, installed, I think, a number of months ago, maybe close to a year ago, in Sugar Land. Uh, Center Point is using this color because they say TxDOT is choosing this color, which was chosen in 2014. I'm also concerned about the highways and freeways in Houston. And this is an unshielded decorative light, which is especially devastating for trying to sleep. The question is, is does all this white light prevent crime? And there's no indication that that's necessarily the case. This is a next door listing found by our president, Joe Califf. And he says this came out the first night at the a Houston LED street light was turned on. It says, just found out that my neighbor's black Sahara Jeep Wrangler was stolen last night. The vehicle was parked on the street across from our houses and directly underneath a new LED lamppost. Our guess is it happened between 10 p.m. and 12, but haven't gotten confirmation. At the bottom, he says, the vehicle was parked on the edge of Woodcrest Park area near the train tracks, again, under a very bright light. It's a damn shame, stay safe. Well, what happens is that people have to start really blocking their windows once this is near their bedrooms, or I've even talked to people who moved to the back of the house to sleep because of a bad light. This does zero for neighborhood awareness. It means that even if someone had a motion, detect motion detection light, you wouldn't be able to notice it coming on. Much better is, is subdued lighting allows you to see, but also allows you to notice changes. Maybe a, a car coming down the street with its headlights or someone's motion detector light coming on. That would actually be the best for safety. So let's take a look at how this actually works in real life. On the left is an actual um, fatal accident scene. It's at Bel Air and Atwell. Steve Goldberg and I went out to take the picture. And I was very concerned when I went to, got to the accident scene that there was a white security light from the Phillips 66, extremely, dark, extremely bright, and it's right behind uh, this bus stop. You probably barely notice that there's a bus stop signal here. Now this is a drunk driver, so he did actually run off the road and ran along the sidewalk, hit the bus stop sign, and hit someone on a mobility scooter crossing from the Phillips 66 toward here. But look what this um, light is doing as far as distraction and visibility to a place where there's a high likelihood of people crossing one street or the other. It's not making it visible, but the, it's making these people very, very inconspicuous. The question is, would you rather have a drunk driver see the scene on the left or see the scene on the right? The visibility can actually make a difference between a, a near miss and, um, and a fatality. By the way, the, the city on the right is Tucson, Arizona. This is after their LED streetlight retrofit, and they have a professional observatory outside the city. 
This is what we mean by dark sky lighting. It's actually very good lighting on the ground. So ordinary window coverings can't block a bad light outside your window. As we've discussed before, there are people who've had to use um, had to use cardboard and duct tape to keep any of this light coming around the edges because it'll appear so bright, just even small amounts coming around the edges of curtains. Now imagine if you have a soft, warm, low glare environment. This is high pressure sodium. This is a Katy neighborhood that had not built the houses yet. It's similar to the lighting in the north half of Woodside subdivision. And we were sent there by project manager Shelton Mitchell to see what this lighting looks like. There is now lighting in the same color in LED, which has better color rendition. Things don't look quite so yellow. You can tell the grass is green is the way it was put to us and is more even. So that would be the way to go outside of residential homes. Now there's a lot of good products out there now, but this one has by far the best commercial. This is the Cree RSW LED streetlight. Energy cost savings your city needs with warm color temperatures and low glare your citizens want. Utilizing Cree's patented WaveMax technology, it directs light where it's needed and away from people's bedrooms. The groundbreaking, nobody will want to saw it down, Cree RSW streetlight. So this is one of the very first products that came out. And now many, many makers are making low glare, warmer street lights at this point. One I'd like to mention is Luma Can, which has created a product called the Luma, Can Luma Canna. Um, it's a company out of Canada. And um, it was a, someone concerned about the lighting paired with a, a lighting vendor to create it. And uh, Audrey Fisher in Chicago is proposing it to be used there. And the, the light cone is supposed to be such that at the next pole, the light from the previous street light ends. And they use a warmer color with excellent color rendition. Now, the last thing I'd like to talk to, which is very important to people like me, is aesthetics. What do you want your city to look like? I used to love the warm glow of Houston driving and, and the beautiful modernity when I would come back from school from New York. Um, we are now creating something that looks rather trashy. There's constantly white glare in your eyes every time you drive. It looks like a forbidding city. So I thought, how can I get that across? And I realized that Hollywood frequently uses lighting to create a mood. So these scenes are from the Netflix hit Stranger Things. You see the nice warm glow of the regular dimension and the upside down where you have the man-eating creatures is lit in a very forbidding bluish color. Now, maybe not all of you are into Netflix uh, hits, so I have a baby boomer version of this slide. Would you rather live on the Hallmark Channel or with the Adams Family? So warmer residential lighting is easier to live with. It's just simply more pleasant. This uh, light on the right actually dates to a couple years ago. They're improving the lighting even further. Uh, but I went to Hemet, California, which is about two and a half uh, hours east of Los Angeles to see these street light tests. And they were wonderful. When you were at the next light over, you never saw the glare from, from, the, from the light, the next one. Whereas in Houston, you might see LEDs from many lights down the road. Um, also, the wattage is a lot less and yet the visibility was excellent. I could easily see an unlit house and there was no glare from the doorsteps um, or from their yard. Whereas in Houston, this is what happened when my new street light came in. I've since asked for a house side shield, which has mitigated some of this glare, but not the incredibly bright white reflection off the street and not what the car, what a driver sees. It's so bright that it turns jet black between this light and the next light because of the glare. That's not a problem in, in uh, California. They are now using 14 watt, 2700K. That's again, the soft white light bulb 
color um, on 25 foot poles. Again, this is now one third of our wattage here in Houston, less than one third. We are still installing 45 watt, 4,000 K street lights in Houston, and there's still decent visibility. There's a, uh, on my website, you can see a video showing that light and a still picture where it's a little darker. There's a few areas where I could find warm street, warm LED technology in Houston. One is that many shell stations converted their canopies a couple years ago to a warmer color. Um, this was taken at the intersection of Westland and Highway 59, and you can see the soft color here versus very harsh color here. We noticed this car pulling out as we were taking pictures. Steve Goldberg caught that really quickly. That car left the, left the station with its headlights off, turned onto Westland, turned onto the Southwest Freeway feeder road, all along the lights off. And I'm seeing this more often. Um, people just think it's daylight uh, from these parking lots and just forget to turn their lights back on or the, or the automatics get fooled. Unfortunately, this Westland station and the ones at Kirby have switched back to white. I don't know why I'm trying to find out. Um, Sally Alcorn is one of our most supportive city council, uh, city council supporters, and she was also wondering why. But many, uh, many shell stations still have this warmer canopy lighting right now. Rice University recently installed beautiful pedestrian lighting. You can look directly at the LEDs. It's hard to tell from this picture, but these are rectangular arrays of little LEDs. And from most angles, you can look directly at them with absolutely no discomfort. And they create this beautiful soft glow. These are examples of acceptable versus unacceptable lighting fixtures when you're looking for lighting for your own home or your business. And the difference is that all the ones on the left are either aimed or designed so that you see the light bulb or the LEDs, in this case, in, in more modern times. And all the ones on the right are similar lights of similar design, except they are designed to hide the light bulb when seen from the side. This keeps the light on the, on the property and keeps the glare out of your eyes. And I'm gonna show you in the next slide this clip-on uh, clip shield just for the bare floodlight bulbs. So this is a great product that you can still buy at parshield.com. And it's designed to clip only on the full size floodlights. There are still some LEDs made in this full size called PAR 38s. And this allows you to still aim the light outward, but it shields the light as seen from the side. So the shield is strongly angled. And I think we need more products that are designed this way with an angled shield. So if people want a little bit more coverage on their driveway, they can angle the light out and yet it's still shielded when seen from the street. This is a Hinkley shelter. These are both lights I've used at homes of different styles. This is a contemporary one. There's sconces. There's also wall versions of this. And you can screw in any light bulb you want. I have a, an eight watt warm white LED small flood in mine. And my porch is very, extremely well lit using this, this uh, light. It even bounces actually into the ceiling of the porch. So it doesn't look like a, a cone with darkness behind it. This is a design, we now can find lights with integrated LEDs. So there's warm LEDs up at the very top and this fixture has a dimmer and it's moderately priced. You better hurry because they've gone up from about $45 when I bought it to about 56 now. Um, but this is a, a one you can find readily available online but it's hard to find in stores. Home Depot does carry it online. It's called the Westinghouse. And well, it's a, a transitional design. You can find many like this. Uh, at full brightness, it goes way down the sidewalk. You can feel comfortable that someone coming to your house can see well. At the dimmest setting, you still have a beautiful soft glow for your porch overnight. Sports field lighting is also greatly improved, but you need to catch sports fields if possible before they install lighting, if there's new ones being built near you. So this sports field is just as well lit as this one on the, in the playing area, but this is a view from the nearby sub, uh, subdivision where there are houses. They are not nearly as disturbed while those lights are on. In Houston, I would say about 70% of our driving glare is due to bad lighting, which is aimed outward and is on hinges. I've mentioned to the city council, if we could just direct people to turn the hinges downward, we wouldn't reduce energy use unless people also remove some of the lighting, but we would dramatically reduce glare with very little effort. All someone has to do is get up there and tilt it downward. 
Chris Monrad, our lighting engineer advisor from Tucson, said that people are mistaken about how LED lighting works. The light spread is built into the optics and you can get dis different degrees of spread. Um, there is no advantage to tilting the light up. All that does is create glare. Notice that when they tilted the light down, this is before and after, same fixtures, but notice how much brighter it is on the ground. So if you really need only this brightness to see well, you could do that with a fraction of the amount of light if you're pointing it downward. Here's home lighting. This is porch lights where you can see the bulbs, but notice that the stairs look very dark and the sides of the house look very dark. This is what happens if you hide the bulb. And notice, I put the picture on the left because notice that you don't need an enormous amount of brightness to see these steps far better than the previous photo. This is the par shield in action, clipped onto a bare floodlight bulb. Um, even if you have a bad, bright, glary bulb, you can greatly mitigate it. These are moderately priced and they come in bronze and white. When they're on the bulb at night, it actually turns into looking like a much more upscale uh, light fixture. You just see a dark silhouette for this whole, whole assembly here. And notice how much better you see the area behind that bulb. Between here, that's the that ghostly effect called bailing luminance, and here where it's nice and crisp. This is where we are and where we need to be. This is a January 2019 aerial photo of Houston. Every single light that you can see from an airplane, most of these are business lights, not our street lights that are pointed upward. Every one of these represents glare in your eyes as a driver. This is Tucson after its LED street light um, retrofit. They use a warmer color. Tucson has a lighting ordinance which forbids glare even coming from business and homes. So the amount of light can be quite a bit less and still see much better. Los Angeles, I thought this would be a game changer for us because we are a huge city like Los Angeles is and we modeled our lighting after Los Angeles. In 2016, they abandoned the whiter color um, and they moved to a warmer color. The Richard Sari Goomba in the Los Angeles office told me I can see those colors in the model numbers. WW or 30K represents the warmer colors. NW, these are the superseded older lights, means neutral white or the 4000K color. So look at the way the wattage has steadily dropped. This is a 100 watt HPS that's replaced. That's a residential light that we've been replacing. Right now they're down to 27 watts and their lights are dimmable. We're still using 45 watts in a wider color. Um, we had the same 95 watt light to start with as Los Angeles to replace 150 watts. They are, look at this, they've gotten all the way down to 34 and they've been at the 54, 60 watt level for quite a while. This is contrary to what Mayor Turner was told. He was told we would have to go up in wattage if we use warmer light. And I will explain to you why that turned out not to be true in a minute. Um, inside, you should also be protecting yourself from bluer light before you go to sleep. I love the Philips Scene Switch bulbs. They come in lamp, regular light bulbs, and also floodlights. And just with the flip of a switch, they switch from 5000K or daylight color, which is great during the day, mixed with daylight, to warm white or 2700K, to half bright amber, which is terrific for winding down at night and trying to make sure you can sleep. Um, these are great for bathroom lights and for bedside lights. At night, I'm, I am a bit of a night owl, I must admit, but this is the color of the screen I'm looking at. I'm using an app called F.Lux. All modern screens and both phones and computer monitors now come in with built-in settings, which will automatically take the bluer light out of your, your backlight at night to help you unwind at night. So what can you do? Well, this is a new tool which came up just two weeks ago and is huge. The Illuminating Engineering uh, Society has now joined forces with the International Dark Sky Association, making all the second re same recommended, sorry, all the same recommendations the IDA has made for years, which is first decide whether you even need a light where you're placing it. Um, you really only need it over entrances. No one is going to break into the middle of a brick wall. Um, make sure the light is directed only in the section that you need light lit. Use lower light levels, because what that does is it allows you to see into the less well-lit areas much better. Um, use controls, dust to dawn or motion detection. Motion detection is terrific for scaring off someone before they even commit a crime, because it increases the chances they will be seen. 
And now they're also recommending to use warmer colored lights where possible. Um, the lowest blue possible is best for residential areas. Um, they changed in their new recommendations. This stands for roadway and parking lot lighting. In RP818, they have come so much around to the international dark sky way of thinking that I was strongly urged to spend the $350, which no normally a city would do to buy the standards so I could understand them. And what I noticed is they have a chapter two about how the ICs light at night. And they said they had changed their thinking. Before, when they were telling cities to use a bluer color, they were using what's called the scotopic curve or how the eye operates in a dark environment when it's using mostly the rods, which see in, dar in darkness, and not the photopic curve, which uses the cones, which help us see color at light. They now say they realize that under street lights, we are using the photopic curve. This is a light sensitivity, sensitivity curve for color and how the eye is most sensitive. And notice that the photopic curve is shifted to the yellower part of the spectrum. So they were thinking that the lowest wattage, most efficient light is over here. But notice if you use the photopic curve, that's not a very sensitive spot at all. Chapter two says they no longer recommend that cities increase wattage if they use a warmer color of LED street light. This is enormous. It is the reason we didn't get better lighting in Houston. So you can talk to your community and decision makers. Um, insist that your public works department, and if you're outside Houston, please look at this. Use the newest recommendations. They are worth buying. We were told that they should be good for several years and be current. RP-8-18 educate your community. This uh, website, softlighthouston.com, is designed for the average person, not the lighting engineer and not the advocate, to quickly and easily understand lighting. The disappearing pedestrian videos on there, the four light bulbs with the different degrees of glare are on there so they can see. And best of all, we have the Houston Police, uh, sorry, the Houston Police Department Berkeley Prevention brochure link and quote asking us to use soft shielded lighting pointed downward. Art Acevedo ordered that change, and here it is. Non-glare soft lighting and downward shielding is optimal when selecting lighting products to achieve optimal vis visual results. I recommend printing this out and highlighting when you talk to your civic club. And then seeing is believing. We have a terrific lamp demonstration, which we found does not photograph well, but I will show you a photograph of how it works. I need to uh, thank my friend Luzette, who I hope is watching now or will watch later, for mentioning this lamp. Um, she's a high school friend who said she bought it to, um, to, so she could read in bed without disturbing her husband. And she told me, you've got to get this lamp. It's got five colors of white, from warm, very warm white to a cool white, and seven brightness levels. And it has a gooseneck, and it's very moderately priced. It's only, now it's up to about $24 on Amazon, and I have a link to this lamp on my website at the bottom of the education page. I use two figures, and I like to use toys, both for their scale and also for their color, because you can see color rendition too. So I use a figure, either an action figure or a car, and McDonald's Happy Meals toys are actually great sources for the price of a Happy Meal. Um, I use one directly underneath, but also one behind, and then I try different lighting scenarios and, and show people the difference in visibility. So here's the worst case scenario, bad security light tilted about 45 degrees toward your eyes. And here's the guy in front, the guy behind. What I cannot show you in a photo, but I show people real time at the end of my talks, is that if you hold up your hand and block this light, this guy pops out. He's not invisible because there's no light on him. He's invisible because of the glare. Then I can turn the light down, turn it to the warmest color. And notice all these dots here, that means that's the brightest. There's only one dot here that's the lowest setting, and the entire room and both figures are much more clear. This is why this kind of lighting saves cities money and also is the best for if you're trying to mitigate climate change. Houston just came out with its climate action plan. Lighting should definitely be part of it, even that it should be included in future street lighting, and there's so much we can do with private lighting, with just some education, but that education has to come from the top. I cannot personally talk to 4 million people. So uh, again, here's some resources for you, darksky.org, um, which is very comprehensive, softlighthouston.com for the general public, 
the Texas chapter is revising their, their uh, website that's called idatexas.org, and that should come online soon. I have a resources document. So all of these things I've told you, I have the backup links and references to in a single document. I have a contact page at softlighthouston.com. So if you decide to advocate and need that, let me know. I most recently wrote a journalist in Warwick, uh, in Warwick Rhode Island. I got a letter two days later saying the city council wants my resources document. I sent them to Los An that Los Angeles had gone down in wattage. And he told me the way Warwick goes is probably going to be the way that all of Rhode Island goes. There's a LAMP demo link on the education page, and we have the HPD guidance link on the education page. I'd like to thank Chris Monrad, who was hired by Tucson to oversee their lighting. He's helped us with information since 2015. Uh, this is Jim Benya, who's been enormous help. He's written the city four times, starting with Mayor Parker backing us up. He's won hundreds of lighting awards. He's one of the most prolific international, international lecturers. We have great people backing us up with information. They have seen every email I've sent to uh, city council. Um, rarely have they told me I was wrong about anything, and they've often written in support. This is Bill Wren, famous for his work with oil rigs, trying to protect the skies of West Texas. He came in all the way from San Antonio, uh, where he had a doctor's appointment because he was, quote, in the neighborhood, which I guess is relative if you're living in West Texas, spoke to city council with us in January 2016. Mayor Turner did express interest, but unfortunately, two weeks later, uh, Center Point, in conjunction with Public Works, said that we would have to increase the cost of the lighting and increase the wattage, and that basically killed it. And all the information I sent later was not taken seriously because at that time, the Illuminate Engineering Society and many lighting vendors were fighting our information. That's no longer the case, so I'm hoping people, those of you who live, say, in Sugarland, where um, the light, actually the lighting um, department at Fort Bend County is supportive, um, but we all have to work with the utilities that are putting in the lighting. Um, so, and the Woodlands has not started, that could be a, a great place to get better lighting. We now have all the backup we need. This is uh, Memorial Park Eastern Glades. I'm grateful to Lance, uh, Lance Gandy's Gandy Lighting 2 for putting some dark sky lighting placards out there and choosing a warmer color of LEDs. I called to ask if they were dimmable because they're still pretty bright. So I recommend if you go jogging out there, the trail is well lit, but if you jog on this side where all the lights are, uh, you're gonna get some of the glare in your eyes and the surrounding areas are gonna turn black. If you, um, if you jog over here where the LEDs are not hitting you as directly, you still see the trail well, but you also will see all these areas over here. That's where you're most likely to be assaulted from is out here. Again, fainter lighting means you see the less well-lit areas better in addition. This is our future if we do nothing. Uh, light pollution is increasing 2% a year, and that white scattered light is making things worse. Um, this is what a dark sky city looks like. Flagstaff, Arizona was the first dark sky city. They are in the process of switching from uh, low pressure sodium to amber LED. They're using a special narrow band LED that can be filtered out by the nearby observatory. This is a city of 107,000. Notice they are not sacrificing visibility on the ground, yet this is the view six miles away um, at, at low observatory. So thank you so much for listening. I know this has been a long slog. Um, if you talk to your civic club, all you need is a one minute light demonstration to distill down everything I've said. And let me see if I can get to the point where I can stop sharing the screen. Um, I think I need to do that. And see all of you guys again. There we go. Thank you Excellent. so much. Thank you, Debbie. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, we did have a couple questions that came up. Uh, Michael, uh, Michael Lloyd asked, uh, well, he actually mentioned uh, Flagstaff, Arizona has outstanding LED lighting, by the way. I'm a firm believer in what Debbie is telling us. And Jim Tucker just asked, uh, common fluorescent lights will fade wall art on paper. How does this type of art objects and diplomas, et cetera, respond to the 2,700, 3,000 K LED indoor lighting? Actually, that's a question I'm not sure how to answer. That's probably the ultraviolet component. I don't know if that's as much of a component in art lighting. That might be a good question for the art museums um, to, to take a look at. I know there are some white, I, at one point I bought a white LED picture light. So that would definitely be a, con a concern. 
but I'm not sure whether, I think LED lights may not have as much ultraviolet light as fluorescent lights have. Okay. Uh, Lou asks, has there been any studies on how the softer lighting affects the Bortle scale? Um, we know that, that, um, that even though Tucson used a higher uh, blue light, they used 3000K at the time. Uh, as Chris said, if he had to do it over again, he would use a little bit warmer, but they use it at a lower level and they have dimming controls. He was able to, re even using not amber light anymore, and they had shielded amber before, he still reduced light pollution about 7%. They were estimating 14%, but he thinks there's still some bad business lighting out there that might have affected their results. Um, but, oh, I need to put them on there. There's some photos of before and after. Take a look at the um, German, they're, they're, sorry, the Austrian village video on my website, and you can see a lot of before and after. Definitely warmer and shielded um, will definitely reduce light pollution. Compared to what anything we've had, if we were to use even 3000K at the level that Tucson was using and eliminate all the glare, Houston would be far better. And now we can use 2700K combined with amber where it's affordable. Thanks, Debbie. And a question I had, uh, especially now given the situation, the economics shut down uh, due to COVID-19, potential loss of revenue for municipalities, the city of Houston, et cetera. Has there been a study that uh, indicates what the potential economic savings would be by switching from the 45 watt lighting to uh, lower, lower wattage versus the cost of making the retrofit? Well, it's, it's a direct one-to-one -one thing. So if you go from 45 watts to 14 watts, uh, you're, you're using two-thirds less energy. The problem is, is that cities also have to neg negotiate a tariff with the utility. So they will have a tendency to want to raise the price per watt. I, I've been thinking Georgia Power does not pass on all the savings to the Georgia cities, but the savings have gotten so great, I'm thinking politically the thing to do is to share the financial advantage. So what if we still got our 50% savings we're always expecting from our 4,000K and then gave some of the savings if we went down another two thirds to center point, wouldn't that flip, their, flip them from fighting us to supporting us because they would also benefit? So if we got the pure savings, like California, it's to their advantage to get pure savings. They're not creating energy, they're buying it. Um, it would be the same as the drop in the wattage. So use two thirds less wattage, it's two thirds less energy. And I wanted to mention one more thing about Tucson, uh, which is very important. John Barentine told me, he's the, at the IDA, told me that they found that a little blue goes a long way. So they found one-fourth the amount of light was adequate visibility compared to high-pressure sodium. Most cities use twice that. Excellent. Hey, Debbie, I have a, uh, actually two questions. That Philipsine switch bulb, was that an LED bulb? Yes, it's LED. I love it. You can get them. Um, you can get some of them at Lowe's or Home Depot. Uh, you can get both kinds in bulk, maybe four at a time from Amazon. Okay. And when you talk about the connection between uh, excessive blue light and melatonin, uh, is that only the blue light that's in your room where you sleep or where you live in your house, or is the blue light out on the street that you experience every day affect your melatonin? Yes, if the blue light makes it through into your living room, it affects the melatonin. Or if you've just driven up to your house and have been exposed to it, or if you've been exposed to it driving um, all around town. Um, you want to try to keep it out of your house before bedtime. Right now, our best bet is probably, you can try asking for a house side shield, and some of their newer designs are a little bit lower glare toward the house. Um, but ideally, it would have been better if we had warmer street lights. And maybe we can still do that where they're not yet installed and in the future. And also, don't forget, Thank you. You know, Bill, forget about your phone or your iPad at night. Make sure its blue light is turned off so that that's what you're seeing um, you know, through your eyes. You know, we can talk about the blue light inside the house, your phone, your TV set. They all give off blue light. Good idea. Right. Thank you. Yeah, cities actually use this as an excuse not to do anything about the street lights. They said, well, everybody's doing it to themselves with their devices. Yet, um, years ago, the device makers gave us a way to cut out that blue light mm -hmm. at night. And it'll happen, you can set it to happen automatically. Absolutely. And you can overrule it if you need to. I think on iOS, de iOS devices, it's called night shift uh, that you could turn on. And I'm sure there's an equivalent in Android. I, and and on not. Android, there's twilight. Yeah, there you go. 
I'll go ahead and uh, ask anybody who wants to ask a question to go ahead and unmute yourself and use this opportunity to ask Debbie whatever questions you have. I'll give everybody a second to do that who may want to. One of the reasons this was too, so long is because I've tried to answer everybody's questions as much as I can. Absolutely. Okay, I'm not hearing any additional questions. Well, uh, thank you, Debbie, very much for the information uh, you shared with us tonight. Uh, it, it's something that we can all take part in. And even though we didn't really discuss the astronomical impact on what it is that we do uh, from a hobby perspective, uh, you know, it certainly transcends many different uh, aspects of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, including uh, the medical and uh, safety aspects as well. So appreciate the presentation. And uh, I'll let me just share my screen here. Uh, just to let you all know, our next monthly general meeting is going to be Friday, June 5th. And if you have any questions about anything that we've got planned uh, upcoming, uh, you have uh, any additional questions you may have about the VSIG meetings that are up, uh, upcoming, uh, any of the lighting discussions that we've had, go visit us at our website, httpastronomyhouston.org, uh, for additional details and information. Uh, if you're into social media, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And again, if you have any questions for Debbie, for Stephen, for myself, or anybody else, you can email us at info at astronomyhouston.org. And uh, I'll be monitoring as well as other uh, folks will be monitoring that particular email address and we'll pass along the information to the appropriate parties. So uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Again, thank you, Debbie, for all of the great information and our meeting is adjourned. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye.